Well, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. I am Pete Stearns and I feel blessed to have called myself one of the pastors here. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us for worship, whether here in the sanctuary or online streaming along with us. If you are here in this space, I want to give you a quick note about our mask protocol during this season. We ask that as you walk through the building or are in the act of actual singing and worship that you have your mask on, but when you are seated uh, for the remainder of the service, you may lower it. We are a church that uh, care deeply about connecting uh, with the community that surrounds us, with those that have not yet found their way into this great community. We desire to make connections uh, each and every week. And so if you are new here today, uh, or you are just getting started with your journey at Christ Church, we want to welcome you to the family. And one of the ways that we do that is through our Christ Church in Five. Uh, we will gather here in the back of the sanctuary in what we call our oak room just to have a few moments, five uh, to be specific, in which we talk through the core values and vision of the church as well as offer you a small little gift to encourage you to get connected in with this church family. If you are online, we invite you to follow the prompts on the screen so that you can have a similar uh, connection experience with our hosts there. Now, as we enter into worship, uh, let us reflect on the words of the psalmist in Psalm 30, verse 4, that says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you His saints, and give thanks to His holy name. seated. As many of you know, this past Monday we reflected upon All Saints Day, 
And so in just a moment, we will enter into a responsive reading honoring those saints who have gone home to be with the Lord this year. In the midst of the reading, we will pause and turn our attention to the screens to remember them by name. Now, we recognize uh, that we have not been able to collect the names of all of those dear loved ones that have passed in this past year. And some of you may be here today grieving and mourning the loss of somebody that was meaningful to you. And we want to come alongside you as a church in prayer and support. And so as you came in today, you will have noticed these cards that were sitting on the tables in the back. And we want to encourage you to take a moment, whether it be during our offering time or afterwards, to write down the names of those loved ones so that we might be praying specifically for you and your family. Now let us together enter into this responsive reading. Our great God, we gather this morning not alone, but with all the saints who worship in your presence. We gather with thanksgiving for the guidance of the Scriptures and your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for the testimonies and wisdom of those who have gone before us in the faith. We thank you. We thank you, our God, for these faithful ones who now rest from their labors. Keep us until that day when we join them in your presence. Cause their witness to quicken us as we serve Jesus with the church universal. For it is truly with all the saints that we pray in Jesus' name. Gracious and holy God, we give you humble thanks for all the blessings of this life. Take our gifts, our talents, and our lives and strengthen us to be your servants in the world. With each new day, rekindle the grace that is within us and mold us to your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Oh, God. 
bow in a word of prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you today humbled by the legacy of those that have gone before us. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that has chosen to empower your church, to write your story with the lives of broken and fallen people. Lord, we think about all of those that we have lost in this past year. And Lord, it is with their stories and testimonies in mind that we thank You for the foundation they have laid for this church to continue to flourish and grow. Lord, we pray that their lives would embolden us to step forward in our own faith journeys. We bless your holy name, O God, for all your servants who, having finished their course, now rest from their labors. Give us grace to follow the example of their steadfastness and faithfulness to your honor and glory. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And now, may we pray united with one voice with all of those that have gone before us as we remember the words that you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive us our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It has been a little poignant for me, perhaps for others here today as well, to be sitting in worship and recognizing that the days in which we have the opportunity to be led by Pete Stearns from this place are slipping away from us. Many of you will know that Pete has accepted a call to become the lead pastor of St. Mark's Church in Burlington, North Carolina, 
and we'll be heading down to that beautiful part of our nation uh, just after Thanksgiving. And uh, I know that this is for many of us a tremendous experience of loss. It is also for the Church of Jesus Christ a wonderful experience of gain. Pete is so ready for this. He has been so well loved and shepherded and groomed in the life of this marvelous church family. And uh, if we did not send out these great leaders, we would not be doing our job as a church that has on its cornerstone the phrase, go into all the world. (laughs) So we're going to have an opportunity to to celebrate Pete in uh, coming days. Next Sunday, I want to just let you know that between services in our garden chapel, there's an opportunity to stop by and say hello to Pete and Brittany and their boys and to offer your own personal wishes. And then on the 21st of November, uh, Pete will be preaching uh, in a new series I'll describe at the end of the service today uh, for the final time. So I just invite you all, at least until we bring him back as a guest, uh, I just encourage you all to come out and join uh, with us for these next couple of weeks. I also want to say that for those of you who did not uh, play a, um, a personal part in last week's weekend worship services that if you did not have an opportunity to listen uh, to the message of that weekend, I would commend that you go back and do so if you can. I wouldn't say that every time. But this particular message really drives us to the heart of the most important relationship we have, the one that ultimately determines the character of all of our other relationships in life. And uh, so I would commend uh, your picking up that message if you get the opportunity to. We are closing out our series on remarkable relationships today, and I want to end by giving you a message that I hope you're going to find really practical. When I am looking for practical wisdom, I often turn to the writing of King Solomon of Israel. As you know, he is renowned to have been someone gifted by God with uncommon wisdom. And in his uh, writings, the Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, we often find a piercing practical wisdom that can make a difference in our life. And so I want to invite you to listen as I read today from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, beginning uh, at, let me see here, verse 7. Hear then the word of our God. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I tolling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one, the writer says, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered. Two can defend themselves And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to suggest in closing this series that at the heart of any really remarkable relationship of life, is a deep and abiding and satisfying connection with another person that goes by the simple word friendship. Friendship. The best relationships between husbands and wives, between co-workers or teammates, between siblings or social acquaintances always have this value, this set of practices in common, don't they? How many of us can think of somebody with whom we enjoy this kind of amazing bond we call friendship? Even Jesus said this was actually the blessing he had come to give to his disciples. In one of his last conversations with the disciples on uh, the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you my friends, for I have made known to you everything that the Father has made known to me. 
Uh, Jesus' uh, view of his disciples was that they be his friends. It's a sad thing when somebody goes through their life without this kind of bonded relationship. And in our uh, scripture text for this morning, King Solomon of Israel mourns this very reality as he sees it. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was this man all alone. What is it that God says at the very beginning of the creation? It is not right for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. And now, decades, centuries later, Solomon is mourning the existence of this man who is so alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. In other words, I saw this person whose life was consumed with work and wealth, and yet neither of those things brought him contentment. He may have had a lot of people around him. He probably did, but he had nobody who really shared his life in the deepest, intimate sense of it. He was active and he was affluent, but he was all alone. He lacked a true friend. Friendship, I think, is the key to to overcoming loneliness when we're by ourselves. Just the very memory of a friend can sometimes make a difference for me when I'm feeling lonely. They don't even have to be on the phone. I just think of their face and I don't feel quite so awful or isolated. But friendship is also the key to overcoming the problems that occur even in some of the real relationships of our lives. Friendship is one of the most important ways that we overcome the challenge of living with other people. When the fabric of our friendship is strong, then it can bear the winds and the worries that will beset a relationship. When the fabric of our friendship with somebody else gets weak and worn, it's only a matter of time before the inevitable pressures of our imperfections and theirs and of life's difficulties bring the kite of our connection down, down, and maybe even crashing down. This is why if we're trying to renew a faltering relationship, or trying to prevent a failure of a relationship in the first place, it pays to make sure that we are investing in the particular practices by which friendships grow. And I want to think with you today on four such practices as they're illumined in the words of King Solomon in Ecclesiastes 4. Four practical patterns that you can practice, I can practice, to strengthen the friendships in our lives. The first of those investments is suggested by the question that Solomon poses in verse 8 of Ecclesiastes 4. He asks, for whom am I toiling? Why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Sometimes this is what life feels like. Sometimes life just feels like a miserable business like it's a parade of meaningless toil, that the people around us are actually part of that problem. I think back to a a time in my marital relationship when the fabric of love between Amy and me had been tested by the pressures and the winds of life. We were both in school at the time. We were both working hard at jobs. We were struggling with young children. We didn't feel like we had enough money. It was really easy to start looking at the spouse here in the, in the puzzle as, as another drag on our lives, as another challenge, as another irritation. And the truth is we were part of each other's problems just because we're human beings. About that time, a seasoned couple in our church asked if we'd like to use their vacation home in Naples, Florida for a week. And and, and frankly, as this offer was tendered to us, it was an awkward moment because we weren't entirely sure we wanted to spend that much time locked up with each other. (laughs) A lot of married couples can understand this. You have these moments. And... And so we just paused for a moment, hesitated when they made this offer. 
We were conscious of all of the, the stresses that might impose upon us and all the work and stuff we had to do back home. And so we started to, to express those feelings, but the couple wouldn't give up. They kept pressing. We can't leave the kids, we said. Oh, yes, you can. We're going to come and take care of the kids. <laughs> but, but we've got this dog, and we know you don't like dogs. We'll get over it. We'll take care of the dog. Talk about having friends. <laughs> this was a veteran couple. They knew the rhythms and the rigors of marriage. They, they, they could see the stress that was on ours at the time. They were willing to sacrifice to help us. They dissolved all of our excuses. And so we went. It wasn't pretty at first. <laughs> We hadn't had that kind of one-on-one -on -one FaceTime for years. There were a lot of issues between us that, that had not been talked about or that needed reconciliation. And our energy for even doing that kind of work was low. We were worn out. And so at the start, we just rested. We took naps in separate parts of the house. We took walks. And then... We walked together, and we walked on the beach together, and we went swimming, and we went out for dinner, and we went home to bed early, and it went on like this for several days, and then this really bizarre thing started to happen. We started to look into each other's eyes across the table at the other differently, and the feeling for both of us was, Oh, I remember you. We used to have a lot of fun together. I mean, we were such friends once upon a time. And we started to really talk again. And the fire of the good returned. I've seen the same process unfold in my workplace over the years. I, I can think of a time in the journey here that uh, tensions within the staff were pretty high. We were, diff we were a, a talented group of people, but they don't always see eye to eye on everything. And the pressure of week in, week out ministry was getting on everybody's nerves. People were feeling underappreciated or they're feeling irritated by the, the work style or communication style of that person. And Sherry Adams, who was our HR director at the time, says, I've got an idea. Let's go on a retreat together. And all of us just groaned. I knew as the head of staff, I should be supportive of this. I groaned at the thought of spending that kind of time together. Do we have to go, meaning with these people, when there's so much work to be done? And then we were off on the retreat. And we were eating meals together. And we were taking walks together, and we wound up going out bowling together. And Sherry organized this, this wild car rally scavenger hunt in which we laughed together and adventured together and suddenly began to look at each other differently, much in the way that I described earlier with Amy and with me. Why are you depriving yourself of enjoyment? The writer of Ecclesiastes pens, that's the question God may be asking some of us today as well. Don't you realize that no relationship becomes or stays remarkable without the practice of regular play? How can you restore that part of the kite of your connection with somebody important in your life? Maybe it's time to plan the overnight away together, or maybe a real vacation. Perhaps you need to take a ballroom dancing class together, or sign up for sailing lessons, or pursue some uh, interest where neither of you is an expert. You're both learning, you're both going to fail, and you'll do so with a sense of humor together. Maybe you ought to watch more comedy movies, or maybe you ought to watch me play golf. That will make you laugh. Go on a walk together on this beautiful day. 
plan a dinner party with people that you love or would like to get to know and might just, if you knew them, love them. Go to a funeral together. Go to a nursing home together. Remember how good it is just to be alive and to be as healthy as you are today. It may not get better from here. Celebrate today together and think how good it is to have someone by my side right now. For this time, this friend sharing something of life with me. Volunteer together at a children or youth ministry event. Remember what it looks like, what it feels like to be somebody who actually plays and counts their greatest wealth in life, their friends. So the first practice of friendship, play more. Secondly, the second piece of counsel Solomon offers in verse 10 of this passage is this. If one falls down, His friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Neil Jacobson is a clinical psychologist at the University of Washington. And Jacobson found in his research that most relationships suffer critical injury, not so much from the direct pressures within the bond as from the pressures that come at the relationship from the outside. Let's face it, this world beats us up. Uh, it, it, It pummels us in so many ways. Work wears us down, financial demands weigh upon us, the callousness, the criticism of the people that we meet, the conflict in our society today, all of these different spheres of life weigh on us, driving us lower and lower and lower till we have very little to give to our most important relationships. How many of us who've been in the workforce know, gosh, I poured it all out today and now I have to, what am I gonna have left to give to you, my kids, my spouse, my neighbor? This is why one of the most important practices some of us need to learn is simply to ask the question, how was your day, really? How did it feel for you? How's it really going? And then really listen. And if you don't get a deep answer, ask the question again in a fresh way. No, tell me more about it. What was the high? What was the low? What was hard? What brought a smile to your face? When they talk about some of the difficulties, don't try to solve the problem. Just share the burden. Share before trying to solve. In fact, forget the solving. Just share. Just share it. Express empathy. Let this weary person you're in the company of know that if this world has beaten them down or they have fallen down, they have got a friend, someone who's there to help them up. Back in September, I cast a vision for our congregation that involved each of us doing something to lift one person up each week. Remember me saying that? Let's, let's, let's make sure every week we're doing something to lift. We're writing the card. We're making the call. We're, we're extending the gift. We're building the relationship. Something to help lift people up. Jacobson found that couples who routinely help to lift each other's spirits in the face of the pressing weight of life were dramatically more successful than in preserving the bond than in those that didn't bother after a while to continue to try and lift the other. Are you practicing this particular discipline of friendship with the people closest to you? This is the way of Jesus, said the Apostle Paul. We are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So play more. Take deliberate steps to lift the spirit of the people around you. Or think about getting even better at the third practice of friendship. Solomon is getting at this one when he writes, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? As some of you know from personal experience on the counseling couch with me, whenever I marry a couple, I ask them to tell me what it was about the other person that made them fall in love. 
I asked them to describe what it is about this other person, as if I were a complete stranger, just tell me, what is it about this other person that you so cherish and respect and admire that you would give away the one life you have to have that person as your partner for the rest of your life? And the couple start talking. And usually what starts out a bit awkwardly and haltingly becomes a torrent of feelings and thoughts and impressions and I scribble as furiously as I can and take down exactly what they're saying as much as I can and then I feed it back to them at their wedding. And then I tell them then that I'm going to give this to them afterwards so that when life gets harder they can go back and read what it was that they felt at the beginning. What is actually true of that other person? Probably always. And you know what? Life always gets harder. It definitely gets harder. And it's easy to forget Degree by degree, our own sin, the sin of other people, the pull of this world pulls us apart and there comes a day in almost every single relationship, work relationship, marital relationship, uh, social relationship, there comes a time when we find ourselves far away from each other, much further than we ever thought we would be. And in that distance, we feel terribly alone. We feel cold on our own. And it's in those moments that we especially need to take steps to warm the other. Legendary marital therapist John Gottman, who I've quoted earlier in the series, writes, fondness and admiration are two of the most crucial elements in a rewarding and long-lasting romance. Let me read that one more time. Fondness and admiration are two of the most crucial elements in a rewarding and long-lasting romance. It's those things that the couples describe when I ask them the question. It's about the fondness and it's the admiration they feel. Although happily married couples, writes Gottman, may feel driven to distraction sometimes by their partner's personality, I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise hands, they still feel that the person they married is worthy of honor and respect. They haven't lost sight of the things on that sheet that they fell in love with, that they admired and respected early on. This is why Gottman's number one strategy for helping couples in marital trouble is not to plumb the problems they have with each other. Wow, that's kind of counterintuitive. Why aren't we talking about all the things that aren't working? Gottman has found through decades of research that a pathology approach, a pathology-focused approach, only takes you so far. Instead of trying to dissect all that's not working, build what works. Build the friendship. Work on that stuff and see if it doesn't create a, a rekindled bond that gives you the strength to then unravel some of that other stuff. Though a lot of it won't get unraveled. We're living with sinful people and they with us and we're not going to be fully fixed until we stand with Jesus face to face and forevermore. So what Gottman does is he gets couples, and this works I think in work relationships too, and other kinds of friendships, he gets these, these pairs to figuratively or literally lie down together, as King Solomon suggests. Gottman gets the couple and says, I want you to get really close to each other, and I want you to do one of the following exercises every single day to heat up the fondness and the admiration that's just gone cold. It's still there. It's still there, probably. But we need to heat it up. And so here are some of the exercises that he gives. Feel free to try these at home, at work, wherever relationships seem hard. One, describe one character trait 
or one physical attribute you find sort of endearing or lovable about the other. It's there. Or think of a good time in your relationship and talk about what was so good about that? Why was it so good at that time? Name one thing about the other that makes you proud. Something about them that you admire. Describe one strong value, belief, or interest that the two of you have in common and why that's important to you. Talk about a common goal you once had or might still have. Describe a time when you felt really supported by the other, and why that was important to you. Tell the story of your meeting and why you decided to bind yourself together in the first place. Discuss a vacation or playtime that you remember sharing and what was so special about it. Describe one thing that the other person does that makes your life easier than it would be if you were not with that person. Talk about one thing that you planned or produced together that turned out reasonably successfully, maybe really well. Name one difference between you that you have somehow managed to adapt to successfully. Describe a tough time that you managed to weather together. Think of another love or work or social or family relationship that you have seen that is in worse shape than yours and rejoice, at least we're not as bad as that. <laughs> you can get these ideas in greater length in John Gottman's book, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. But I think you get the idea. Build the friendship. You know, John Gottman was not the first person to figure this out. And certainly not the first one to write about it. You may be familiar with these words from St. Paul. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I, I just want to really encourage you to pay attention to that one word, if anything is. In other words, Paul's not saying that there won't be difficulties and frictions and problems and imperfections. Yes, yes, yes. Don't focus there. Don't focus there. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, and the God of peace will be with you. If you want a relationship filled more with a sense of peace than of problems, Think on such things and see if it doesn't warm up that old fondness and affection. Finally, I want to invite all of us, and myself included in this as a helpful reminder, just to keep working at the fourth practice of friendship that Solomon commends here. It's simply this. Defend the people close to you. Defend them. Solomon writes, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Now I want to qualify what I'm about to say because we live in an age where sometimes I think we defend each other to a fault. Sometimes parents defend their kids to a fault when what they ought to be doing is helping their children confront their faults. There's a certain amount of, of loving confrontation that's required in relationships, as you know. But that said, I think we will never really have truly remarkable relationships with the people in our lives until our children and our spouses and our coworkers know beyond a shadow of a doubt that at the core, we've got their back. We are for them. We've got their back. They need to have memories of times when you stood up for them, I stood up for them as they were feeling the world standing against them. When you believed the best of them as others were suspecting the worst of them amidst a world of people who are ambivalent about them all of the time, who are actively sometimes arrayed against them, do the people closest to you know that you believe God has appointed you 
to be part of their strong defense. Do they know this? Let me close by just saying that I, I know it's not easy to do any of the things that I've been talking about this morning when the relationship has gotten very frayed. I, 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 I know it's not easy to prioritize play in the culture of toil. It's not easy to lift others up when we already feel weighed down. It's not easy to warm up affection when the connection's gone cold. It's not easy to defend imperfect people instead of joining the attack against those imperfections. It wasn't easy for Jesus to cross eternity either. It wasn't easy for him to climb upon a cross to sacrifice himself for our sakes either. But he did it because that's what Love does. And he has called us not to love in a merely regular way, but to love the way he loves. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. As hard as these kinds of behaviors we've been talking about throughout this series are, they are what renew the fabric of friendship. And God's word promises that the people who invest in building in this way will have a good return for their work. So as far away as the good seems to be in some of your relationships right now, you can see it return. You can. You can leave behind the world of regular relationships and enter into the kingdom of God's remarkable ones. And I hope this series has helped all of us move a bit further in that direction. For this is the call of Jesus. This is our commission. This is our destiny to which all of us, I pray, will say, Amen. As we mentioned earlier this past week, we remembered the lives of the saints that have gone before us. But as we look forward to this week, on Thursday, we will be reflecting upon the veterans that have and do serve our country. And so today, as a church, we want to take a moment to recognize those men and women who have sacrificed their time and their lives to serve and protect our liberties. Uh, We would ask that we take a moment as a congregation to uh, celebrate their service. And so we want to invite all of those that are veterans or active servicemen and women to please stand so that we can applaud your service. As you remain standing, we want to invite the families of those veterans or other veterans to please stand because we know that it is with your support at home that these men and women can serve. So if you are a family member of one of our veterans, please stand. You may be seated. Now, we are cognizant that the service of so many men and women have enabled us to gather here in worship today, to experience uh, the freedoms of glorifying our God here under the public specter. But we also recognize that not all of us have been called to be in the military. But like the men and women that we have just celebrated before us, we too are called to lay our lives down in sacrifice before our Lord and King Jesus Christ. And so as we reflect upon the service and the sacrifice of the many veterans who we have built this country upon, 
we take a moment to come before our God with His tithes and our offerings.
You may also wish to stay behind following the uh, responsive uh, chorus at the end of the service to enjoy one final anthem that Marianne is going to play with us uh, for us again that will be similarly powerful and meaningful to you. Uh, There is a prayer embedded in that great hymn that God would crown this country's good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. It is a prayer that friendship, that the ability to see what is good and worthy in the other uh, would somehow overcome that which divides us and tears us apart. And I hope that the message of the possibility of that kind of friendship by God's grace is, has come home for you today in a fresh way. There is a uh, scene in the uh, motion picture Saving Private Ryan in which Tom Hanks uh, is leading a cadre of younger soldiers through an incredibly uh, ravaging uh, scene after scene in battlefield. And you're just amazed at his capacity to, to, to stay strong as they keep looking to him for guidance and are scared as, as anybody would be in these circumstances. Uh, but Hank seems to be endowed with an uncommon ability to exercise courage until this moment comes when he separates himself from uh, the rest of them and they don't know where he's gone. And the truth is he's gone around behind a boulder and is weeping and weeping the pain of all that he's carrying and then pulls himself together and walks back around and retakes command. I think a lot of people go through life this way. I I think a lot of us learn to to hold it together, to maintain the brave face. And and a lot of the time this is is needed because somebody has to to hold it together and to do the, the things that must be done. But many, many more of us than may be obvious just looking around the room here today, around the workplaces that we go to, many more of us are actually feeling it on the inside. And some are actually laboring with some very distracting and damaging and unsettling voices in our head that tells us that we're not good enough, that we're not really wanted, that we're not really beloved. God's word says differently. God says, in effect, the great problem of humanity is that we have forgotten with what a great love we have been loved. And how he has endowed us with the capacity to make of life what it can be. If you are a person that needs to hear that message, if you know somebody who might value having that message come home in a fresh way for them, you will not want to miss the next series we begin this next Sunday. Uh, This new series of messages is just two installments long, uh, but it is going to be a very powerful, transforming uh, series of conversations, and I hope you'll come out for it. Uh, Please know that uh, that we're sharing um, a devotional guide that will companion this that you can sign up for uh, through our church's website. And do remember that November the 21st, the second and last in that series, will be Pete Stern's final day in the pulpit until we bring him back as a guest. Uh, So come on out and be part of that uh, service if you would. Uh, Christmas Spirit Village is around the corner. And for those of you who have been to Spirit Village, you know what an amazing festival this is. A chance to come together and remember the true spirit of Christmas. that 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 the gift of a little child can still change the world. And so this alternative Christmas market that we hold in our fellowship halls and our garden chapel is back this year in person. We'll have live animals, we'll have booths where you can purchase little items that go to support the work of our missionaries uh, overseas and around the corner. It's a terrific time of fellowship. There's delicious food, there's music. It's a very special highlight of the Christmas season and I hope you'll come out. But I also wanna let you know, we could sure use some volunteers to help with it. Uh, We are in need of those who can sit in shops and uh, those who can help to serve food and there are a variety of tasks. We will provide you with costume uh, to be one of the citizens of Spirit Village, uh, but we just would so value having your help. So we want to invite you to volunteer for this, to stop by one of the serve desks uh, after worship today or to to, uh, write us or contact us during the week. We would love uh, your assistance as we seek. Uh, to uh, build up the volunteer team needed. Finally, as we prepare to go this morning, if you would value someone praying for a concern in your life, 
uh, please go to the prayer banner at the back flank of the sanctuary or share that concern with the hosts uh, in the chat online. Uh, and if you are new to the church, uh, Pete Stearns will be available in our Oak Room for Christ Church in Five. It's a great uh, window into this place and all that's out there for you. And uh, once again online, uh, if you just uh, let the host know you're interested in Christ Church in Five, they will provide that for you uh, there as well. Would you rise and receive now this benediction? And now, beloved, go forth in all of the power and the hope of the gospel's message. Seek out the way of the Lord in all of your goings, humbly lifting up those who may have fallen down. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you, strengthen you, fill you, use you, work through you until we meet again and forevermore. Amen. Whoa.